Hey guys, this is Lego Master 99 again today, and today I'm going to uh, show you guys how to write a multiplication program via repeated addition for um, the Redstone Computer version 4.0 <clears throat> and the Arcus um, using Arcus version 1.0. And yeah, without further ado, let's get started. All right, so before we can start programming, you will need you will need two things, and I highly recommend you to have two other things. So the things that you need is that you need the compiler. Um, the latest version as of uploading this, as of recording this video, excuse me, is um, version 1.5 alpha of the core compiler. And the uploader to actually upload your compiled program to the Redstone computer. And for me, I'm using the um, version 1.1 alpha of the uploader, which is the latest version of it. All right, so those are the two programs that you need. And the two things that I recommend you to have are A, the Notepad++ um, Arcus development environment. So here is a fresh run of Notepad++ and also having the Arcus version 1.0 stylers installed. Um, so that's very helpful. And also um, the um, instruction set specification manual here on the wiki page of the Bitbucket repository. So if you go to the wiki homepage, it's right here, this link right here. And this is basically the manual for the entire language here. And it details everything that you'd want to know about the language. So now that we have all of these resources, let's get started. All right, so we want to create a multiplication program by repeated addition. And this is the program that you've seen in some of the showcase videos and stuff before. So what we're going to want to do is open up Notepad++ and we're going to want to create a new text document. So let's save this in our desktop as, um, let's see here, extended computer, multiplication program tutorial.txt. All right, so now that we have that saved, the first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is um, add in the Red Circuit Computer Compiler Target Identifier. And to do that, we're just gonna type in pound RC compile target, and then save that. And we also wanna make sure that we have our stylers turned on. So if we just scroll down here and go to Arcus version 1.0, and if you guys don't have these stylers or you guys don't know where to download this stuff or you guys aren't really sure of what's going on here, you guys can always check out my other videos where I go more in depth into the individual programs that I'm going to be using in today's tutorial. So now that we have our compiler target here, and this, um, and this essentially tells the compiler that this is a program that, um, that it, uh, a program written in Arcus. All right, so before we actually write any code down, let's think about what we want the program to do. So first of all, we want it to multiply two numbers that the user gives, that the user inputs. So we'll need to take advantage of the user input system for both of those numbers. So we're going to need two numbers or two variables to store that first and second number, and then an answer variable to store the answer. And once we have our two numbers that we've um, taken from the user, we want to add those over and over again until um, there's what is it, until it's done multiplying. So for example, seven, if the user gives us seven and seven, we want to add seven, seven times. So the first variable is like a counter. And then the second variable is like the actual data, what we're actually adding over and over again. Another thing that we also want to keep in mind is that if it overflows at any time in the addition process, the repeated addition, basically where the number gets bigger than 255, which is the largest number um, all of these Redstone computers can support, then just shut the computer off because um, the number is not accurate anymore. Now that we have all that in mind, let's get started. So what we're going to want to do first is that we're going to want to create those three variables that we just talked about. So let's say, and this is a comment here, initialize, oopsies, initialize three um, user input and answer variables. All right. And now, if we look in the manual here, to um, create a variable under variable manipulation, we have creating a variable, and the syntax is new, and in the name of the variable, equals an integer. Now I'm just going to leave that right over here for us to see. So let's do new, and then let's say user number, or let's say um, number one, let's just call it num1, is equal to zero, and then new num2 is equal to zero. And then we also want to create our answer variable. So new answer equals zero. All right, so now that we have our variables created here, we essentially, what we want to do is that we want to collect 
user input from the user. And what we want to do is that if the user has not provided that input yet, we'll just keep looping until the user has given us that input. So what we're going to do is I'm going to add another comment here. Collect first number from the user, right? And then, so this basically requires an if statement. So if, oopsies, if, and now we want to test if um, basically the user has input something. And the way we do that, or the way that I'm going to do it in this video is that if we look here, we have four computer input buttons here, and then we have an eight, um, a full byte of data that we can input here. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have it checked to see if we have computer input one pressed. And then if this is pressed, then we will um, save whatever data is here. So like if we just input some data or whatever. So we'll just accept whatever data that's in here and we will copy it into the variable um, number one and number two. So to do that in, in Arcus here, what we're going to want to do is that we're going to want to look at the manual. Yeah, so if we go to the IO input um, section here, we have two syntaxes for this. The first one is inputting and then a port ID to a variable. And the second one is input port ID underscore user input. And now this syntax, as you can see here, it says mainly used in tandem with the if statement. So this syntax allows us to check if any of these buttons are pressed right here. So um, if we look here, we want to check if button one is pressed, so computer input one. So if we look here, we have the IO input port ID for user input one is zero. So what we want to type in here is if input, oopsies, input zero. So essentially what this does, and we'll have some brackets here for some code. So this now says that it will check if input um, zero, which computer input, which stands for computer input one is toggled. And if it is, then we will run some code here. So now that we've um, basically checked if that button is pressed, now we want to actually save whatever number the user put in here into um, just for now number one, this is the first number. So to do that, we need to copy the number here to the variable. So to do that, we just look at our manual again, and we will use or take advantage of this other syntax here. We have input port ID and then variable one. And now if we look here, we have user input panel, which is input port ID six. So we're gonna take advantage of that. So now we're gonna type input, since we wanna copy data from one of the inputs to, or one of the peripherals that are available to the user to a variable. So we're gonna go six for the user input panel and then you want to save that to num1. So what this will do now is that it will save whatever number is input here to the variable num1. And now this is simple enough, but we also said that if it was not true, if user um, computer input one was not pressed, then we wanted to loop over and over again until we got a number from the user so that we wouldn't just have a bunch of zeros in there. And so to do that, we're going to have an else block as well and if it's not pressed, then we want to loop back to this check again to see if it's pressed. So what we're going to need, so what we're going to need is a label. And essentially, this is a um, a go-to point um, if you were talking about oh, like in comparison with other programming languages. So um, this label, let's just call it um, user input one. We'll just call it that. And now we're going to jump since the user input or the computer input one was not pressed. We want to jump back and check again. So we're going to go jump and then the name of the label. So user input one. And so now this will go in a loop. It will loop over and over again until this input zero is toggled. And then if it is, it will save this. Um, it will save whatever value is in our user input is over here to Num1. Now that we have the first number, we also need the second number since we need two numbers to be able to multiply. So essentially, it's basically a copy of this same block. So let's go ahead and paste that. And instead of the first number, it's a second number. And we'll change it to user input two. And we're just checking the same thing. And then we'll just jump back to user input two, like that. So now what we have here is that 
we are looping until um, the user says that they have a, a number to input and then we save that number and then it moves down to the second um, loop here where it checks for the same button to be pressed and then if it is pressed it'll take in the second number and the reason we're able to have the same button here be checked right after another is because every single time this gets checked the computer resets all of these inputs here so we can just keep pressing it and it will um, be different each time oh yeah one thing i did forget is that we also need to save this to num2 not num1 or else we'll just overwrite whatever we wrote here already all right so now that we have our um, numbers collected from the user now we actually need to do the calculation so i'll just say here main multiplication right here all right where we do the actual multiplication, right? So now essentially what we're going to do is that we have two variables here. And this first number will act as a counter and the second number will act as the number to add over and over again. So for example, when we're multiplying seven times seven, that first seven is the counter and then the second seven is the number. So every single time we add seven, we want to subtract the counter by one and then repeat until the counter is zero. And then once the counter is zero, we know that it's multiple, it's added that um, the number of times that we want it to. And then you want to display that number onto the decimal display of the target. And in this case, it's the decimal display of the Redstone computer 4.0. So let's go ahead and implement that. All right. So this, um, what we just described is also going to need a loop since we're going to loop um, that procedure over and over again until the condition is true where the counter is zero. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and create a label for that. And I'm going to call this main loop just because it's the actual action. Let's call it multiply loop. Um, actually, no, let's keep it at main loop. Yeah, let's keep it at main loop. So essentially now what we want to do is that when, every single time we hit the top of this loop, the first thing we want to check is, is the counter zero? And then if it's not, then we will add the, um, the data to answer. So essentially, we're um, accumulating an answer here. So we want to check if num1 is equal to zero. So to do that, we're going to go if, and then num1, and then equals, double equal sign, zero, right? So this will basically tell the computer to check if number one, if the value of num1 is equal to zero. And if it is, that means that the multiplication is complete, right? <clears throat> so since it's complete, then we want to just output it to the display and then stop program execution. So to do that, we want to output the answer to the decimal display. So to do that, we're going to go output. And then we're going to reference our manual here. And then in the IO output section, we, we need the port ID for the decimal display. And that is zero right here. So you want to type in output zero. Oopsies. Now put zero and then the variable that you want to output the display. And that is going to be our answer. So then this will output um, whatever is stored in this variable to the decimal display. And then we just want to stop the program from running. So then we will call an exit right there. All right, so now that we have this check implemented, we need to basically add in the code where if it's not zero yet, then we need to add um, our data number here to the answer for the cumulative multiplication. So we're going to add in an else statement here and then finish our block. And the first thing we want to do is subtract one from our counter. So we're going to go num1, and this is our counter variable. And now to subtract things, we're going to need to use parentheses here. And we're going to go num1 minus 1. And this is just how you write it in Arcus, is that you need parentheses whenever you're doing some sort of operation. And if we did multiple operations, you would need multiple sets of parentheses. Like just to show you, we have num1 minus 1 plus num2. As you can see, you need an extra set of parentheses for every single additional operation you do. So if I wanted to do plus um, answer, just hypothetically, we would need another set of parentheses here and then here obviously to match. But we're not doing that. What we're doing is that we're just subtracting one from our counter here. So we're going to num1 minus one like that. And now that we've subtracted one from our counter, we actually need to add whatever data is in num2 or whatever number is in number two into our answer here. And we also want to make sure, or we also want to keep in mind that if this result um, is bigger than 255, we also want to stop the program because then the answer is inaccurate because this computer cannot represent numbers 
larger than 255. So we need what's called a shift overflow check <clears throat> because that's what that's called. So for a check, we use if statements. So if, and now we are adding whatever is in num2 to the answer. So if we go num2 or answer plus num2, because that's our data, and then causes, and then a shift overflow. So this essentially is the Arcus representation of what I just explained here. And then we need a set of brackets for our if statement. <clears throat> and so if this is true, what we want to do is that since the answer is no longer accurate, we just want to exit the program. So we're going to call an exit right there. All right, so now, but let's say what happens if it does not cause, cause a shift overflow and the number is indeed accurate. Well, we need an else here. So else, we are going to add num2 to whatever is in our answer. So we're going to go answer is equal to answer plus number two. So that essentially adds the value of number two to answer. And then now that we have added this, we want to check if our counter is zero again, and we want to start this all over. So we need to jump back to our label that we've created up here a couple minutes ago. So to do that, we're going to have a jump function and then the name of our label. So main loop like that. Oh, don't forget the semicolon. Now that we've done this, this is essentially every part of the program. And we're all done here. All right. So just to um, encapsulate everything that we just went over, what we're doing at the very beginning here is that we are creating three variables with values of zero to all of them. And then here we are collecting the first number from the user to multiply the counter. And then the second number here, or we're collecting the second number, which is the actual data. And then now that we have those two numbers from the user, we want to actually do the multiplication here. <clears throat> and this basically does repeated addition and makes sure that none of the results from the addition, from the repeated addition, cause a shift overflow. <clears throat> and if it does, then we will exit the program. But if it does not, it will add um, whatever data we have in num2 to, to our answer and then jump back to the top and repeat over and over again until our counter is zero. And then once our counter is zero, we're going to output our answer to the display and exit the program. And another thing I will mention, um, this compiler, the DIC HLC, is flexible with formatting. So you do not need to format everything here like I have exactly. So for example, you could go like this. You could, um, you could have this exit be on the same line. You can go like this. You can basically format it in different ways and the compiler will still interpret the program the same. So now that we have our program written here, let's go ahead and compile it. All right, so let's go ahead and compile this program. So we're going to open up our compiler here, our core compiler. And this is version 1.5 alpha, the latest as of recording this video. So we're going to need to pass in the actual Arcus source file, which we've just written, and the target. So let's go ahead and com um, compile this for the Redstone computer 4.0, since that is the world that I have open right here right now. And now we're going to want to specify the core. So let's just say core one. And I'm going to turn on debug mode just because actually, no, let's leave it out. And yeah, so these are the only three arguments that you need to compile a program with the compiler. So now if we run this, well, all right, then it looks like we have some syntax errors. And um, this is interesting because it actually shows <clears throat> the, um, the uh, whenever you have an error with the compiler. So let's look at this. All right. So if we look here, um, if the compilation is not successful, it will tell us. As you can see, we have syntax check completed four errors found. And if we just read up here, it says token user input one does not match variable syntax, which is um, interesting because I actually forgot about that. So essentially um, to fix this error, we need to open up our source code file here. And the variable syntax essentially for version 1.5 alpha of the compiler is strictly alphanumeric which means we cannot have underscores or symbols or anything like that in our variables or in our labels. So let's just change this to user input one like that. And then change this jump to also user input one since we're jumping to that label. And then here we're going to go user input two. And then also change this to user input two. <clears throat> so now that we have corrected this error, as you can see here, since it doesn't match the variable syntax, now it matches the variable syntax we can go ahead and rerun the um, compiler and oops, wrong program. And hopefully it will compile correctly. So if we go here 
and pass in our source code file and specify right to computer 4.0 and then the core. Now, if we run, as you can see, now it exited, which means there were no errors and it compiled successfully if you don't have debug mode turned on. And a program binary file has appeared here in the same location as the source file. So now that we have this program binary file all compiled and I can show this to you guys, as you can see here, it's now all compiled for the Redstone computer version 4.0 for the first core. And now that this is done, let's go ahead and upload it. All right, so now that we have our program binary file here, let's go ahead and upload this to the, to the Redstone computer version 4.0 and I'm using version 1.1 alpha of the uploader. And um, I'm gonna be generating a data pack instead of doing the conventional uploading method. And I would recommend everyone do the same thing. So let's pass in our program binary file. Let's tell the uploader that we wanna compile, or sorry, upload to the Redstone computer version 4.0 and we want to upload it to core one and I'm going to go ahead and specify <clears throat> option nine which means we're going to clean the core first delete all, um, any miscellaneous data that may be in there and then upload our program using the convention with using the data pack method and <clears throat> as you can see it finished very quickly because we didn't have debug mode turned on and we have our data pack here now it's generated so now let's go ahead and install this data pack and to do that we are going to navigate to our dot minecraft folder and then to saves and then to the world that our redstone computer is located in and then to data packs and we're going to go ahead and drag in this data pack that was just generated and now that that is um so now we've installed the data pack into our world and we just need to run it all right so i have the redstone computer version 4.0 loaded up here so to run the data pack in our world we're going to go ahead and type in slash reload to have Minecraft force reload all of our data packs. And now as you can see here, if it was installed correctly, it'll say loaded uploader data pack for program and then gives us the name of the program. And now we are going to need to get a cow spawn egg. And as you can see here, the core is completely clean already. But if we go ahead and spawn in the cow, it will upload our program to the core. Oh. Boom, just like that. And as you can see, now we have all of our bits um, in here and now that we've uploaded our program <clears throat> into the computer now we just need to debug and run it all right so to debug your program you're going to want to keep in mind two things one when you've uploaded a program that you've just written in, Ar in Arcus you want to run it at the highest clock speed possible so that is 111 and to do that we just flip the switch to change the clock speed and then <clears throat> input just all ones and then flip it back up to load the change <clears throat> or to apply it rather. And the second thing is that I would highly recommend stepping through your program one line of code at a time. Um, I'm not gonna do that in this video because um, I've already debugged it and I already know that it's gonna work. <clears throat> but for programs that you have just written and you don't know if they'll work or not, um, you're gonna want to step through and debug line by line. And to do that on the Red Stick Computer 4.0, you can step in here to the debug center and um, to do that, you're gonna to want to first enable debug mode and then manually initialize the computer by pressing this button. This will load the first line of code. And then you're gonna to wanna to copy this command here. And every single time you paste this command and run it, it will load the next line of code in the program. And then you can check <clears throat> if the computer is doing the things that it said um, that you essentially told it to in the program. And then I would, so if we open up our source code file here, we can essentially compare. And I did this in the um, Fibonacci program tutorial video as well. So if we have our program on the right here and we step through by using this command, every single line of code, you can check every single line of code and see does the computer do it and does it give us the value that, <clears throat> that we expect. And then if yes, awesome. If not, there might be a problem with your program or um, like the way you wrote it, or much more rarely, there might be a problem with the hardware or a combination of those things. Or it might be a problem with the compiler as well since it is a very active program in development. But yeah, since I already know that this program will work, let's go ahead and give it a test spin. So I have already set in the optimal clock speed for this program, the fastest at which it will run at. <clears throat> and now you wanna make sure that you have the core enabled that the program is running on as well. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and turn the computer on. And essentially what will happen 
is that if we look at um, our line of code indicator here for core one, it is first on line one of code, and then line two, and then line, and then I'll go to line three and line four, et cetera, et cetera. And if we recall, the first three lines of code were creating these three new variables here, or rather I should write it like this. There we go. So those the first three lines of code are basically creating a very those three variables, and then it's going to loop here until user input one is pressed. So if we just watch this counter here, it should reset after a little while. <clears throat> and it should just go in a loop. Yes. Yeah, so it went back to line four. Now it's going to go to five and six, and then back to four until we um, basically put in a number and then press user input or computer input one. So let's just do a quick multiplication of four times four. So let's input a four here, and then we're gonna press computer input one. And if we wait a little while, if we wait for a little bit, this lamp should turn off. And then once it turns off, that means that um, the computer has accepted our number. And as you can see, that happened right there. And now we've broken out of the loop. We are on line seven of code instead of line six. And now that we've broken out of this first loop here on the Arcus source code side, we're now trying to collect the second number from the user. So we have the first number, which was four. Now the second number, which will also be four since we want to do four times four. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> press the user or computer input one again. And then we just have to wait for, okay. So now that that happened, um, that basically means that the computer accepted our second number and now if we look back on our Arcus source code file here, once it accepts our second number, it's gonna do the multiplication, which is right down here. And this will run for a couple minutes and then it should give us an answer. All right, so um, the program, the multiplication program has just finished executing and as you can see, we've gotten the answer is 16, which is the correct answer. All right, so that basically wraps up this tutorial. Um, that was a complete development cycle of creating a multiplication program, compiling it, uploading it, debugging it, and running it on the Right Computer 4.0 here. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, if you guys have any questions, please make sure to leave a comment in the comment section and until next time guys see you later bye bye